All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's program, which I've entitled The Celebration of Massachusetts Libraries, A History of Libraries in the Bay State. From the early days of European settlement to the present, Boston and Massachusetts have been friendly to the printed word. In fact, the first printing press in British North America arrived at Harvard in 1636. Libraries, uh, private, public, and academic quickly followed. So Massachusetts author and historian Alan Earls will present a slideshow and discussion of some of the most important milestones, architectural gems, and key figures in this story, as well as an overview of just how richly endowed we are with libraries of all kinds today. Highlights include Ben Franklin's gift to found the first free public library in Franklin, the first library for industrial workers, the first children's library, and the first taxpayer funded town and city libraries, as well as pioneering cataloging systems, philanthropists, architects, and more. So I again wanna thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, and I will thank our partnering libraries of which there are many uh, in the follow-up email. So all a uh, hundred plus of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Alan for joining us here tonight. And Alan, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Fantastic, thank you, Robert. And hello to everyone. And again, thank you to all for enduring our uh, slow getting online here. Um, yep, uh, that was a great introduction. So, I'll, and given that we don't have a whole lot of time, I'll try to move through expeditiously. Um, I've organized this very roughly in some topical areas like firsts. Um, there's so much to say here. This should be a big, 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 thick book, but it's not. So I'm going to give you a relatively quick overview in 45, 50, or 60 minutes. As uh, as Robert said, we had the first printing press in British North America, and Boston proliferated with coffee houses and reading rooms. These were places where people shared what little literature they could get, shared news, and talked about ideas. And there are obviously private and ministerial libraries. Ben Franklin and his autobiography references uh, having surreptitiously or otherwise borrowed books from Cotton Mather's library. Um, but books were around and valued and part of the society. It was a society that valued literacy as part and parcel of their religious outlook. People were supposed to be literate so they could understand the word of God and understand the world they were in. <clears throat> Um, as we mentioned, Harvard Library, Harvard was founded in 1636 and momentarily thereafter started its library system. Very, very small system, might have been too grandiose a word for it at the time, but it was the first uh, uh, library uh, system in the world, world and is now, as we'll see later on, the world's largest academic library. Um, uh, Robert mentioned this earlier, this is the town I'm happy to live in. We were graced by uh, Benjamin Franklin himself with 116 books. We named the town after him and then tapped him on the shoulders, so to speak, and said, I don't suppose you'd like to do anything for us now that we've named a town for you. And could you give us a bell? And he said, no bell, but I'll give you books because that's what country folk need, books so they can learn, learn, learn. The home of the first library was also the home of the Reverend Nathaniel Emmons, who was a a uh, highly regarded Congregationalist minister, kind of a hellfire and brimstone fellow, but an intellectual too. And he kept the books, uh, gave them good care and shared them with the townsfolk. Um, that was the vote in 1790 that took the, the books he gave slightly earlier and made the, them available to all townspeople uh, without question. Uh, that's followed up with a monumental in 1904 Ray Memorial Library building, which has subsequently been added to. Uh, as Robert mentioned, 1815, very early manufacturing site in Waltham, the Boston Manufacturing Company. Um, that They not only established that very early industry, but they established this wonderful idea of having a library for their employees, who were, of course, literate at the time. And that, that was a, a nice perk. The State Library of Massachusetts was begun in 1811 and more formally established uh, in 1826 to support the information needs of government. Arguably the first in the US, it's kind of depends how you count it. Other states began this, but 
we were certainly one of the very first. And it's still there on Beacon Hill today with an amazing collection of books. It functions to some extent also as an archive. And it's a lovely place with great stained glass windows and views of the city. Um, there's a view from inside of the State Library as it looks today. And for, we also have the first and oldest horticultural library, the Massachusetts Horticultural Society established their library way back in 1829 with uh, 20,000 volumes, rare books, seed catalogs, glass negatives. It used to be at the Horticultural Hall in Boston, near the Symphony Hall, but it's now at Elm Bank in Wellesley. As Robert mentioned also, the first dedicated children's library, I think, in the world was in West Cambridge, which is now Arlington, established in 1835 with a bequest from Dr. Ebenezer Learned and a subsequent $30 appropriation by the town. Uh, it was later incorporated in the Robbins Library, which you see pictured there to the left. But within that library is a little plaque you see on the right that describes this really important milestone in uh, libraries and in the education of children. Uh, the Boston Public Library, obviously a true gem a special state statute in 1848 allowed it to be established it was and then it was officially started in 52 by the city it was the first large municipal library in the united states just ahead of new york public and the first major public library to also lend books many many uh libraries insisted that you use the book on premises for a long time and the first to subsequently have a branch library in 1870 and maybe the first to have a children's room, as we'll see Brookline claims that honor too, and I'm not enough of a historian to know who's right. Same timeline, uh, the Whalen Free Public Library has roots going back to 1796, where there were informal libraries in the town. But the Reverend Whalen, the president of Brown University, who I believe owned some property there, um, donated money for it. It was formally established in 1848. And then because of concerns about whether it was actually legal to have a town fund it, note, remember I said for Boston, they had special legislation allowing the city to fund the library. They worked with their legislators to create the Library Act of 1851, which allowed towns to spend money for this purpose. This is a uh, circa 1900 building that followed about 50 years later. Um, also pretty important, New Bedford, uh, public library established in 1852 by the city. There were no philanthropists involved, unlike Franklin here and Wayland. At the time, the whaling industry had made New Bedford quite wealthy, and it had a lot of intellectual ferment that attracted later artists like Bierstad, but before then, uh, other people like uh, abolitionist and ex escaped um, slave Frederick Douglass, who lived in New Bedford. There's some of the artworks that still grace the library today, as well as sculpture, sculptures, sculpting by Bella Pratt <clears throat> and painting by William Bradford. I only learned about this one two days ago. The Insurance Library of Boston, established in 1877. It's apparently the first and only such library in the world dedicated to anything you'd ever want to know about insurance. And it's primarily oriented toward the industry and supported by subscriptions from the industry. You know, big companies will spend thousands of dollars so that their people can use it. But it serves the entire U.S. and individuals, consumers, students can also use it for free, which is a pretty amazing little distinction. As I mentioned, the Brookline Public Library claims they had the first children's room in 1890. But interestingly, it really wasn't a proper uh, library. It was just sort of a place for children to stay out of the way of adults, and the first library librarian supposedly was the janitor. Uh, we were also the first state to have a library board looking at the libraries across the whole state. That was in 1890, which shows how seriously li the libraries were viewed, how important they were uh, seen to be for the state and for its towns. And this is an odd one. Again, probably a first and only. In 1901, the Audubon Society established the Bird Library, a traveling library of bird books that was intended to be circulated throughout the state with the help of the Women's Education Association. No longer active, but for a number of years, books and, and uh, exhibits were circulated around the state to raise awareness of 
um, bird protection and, and nature in general. The Kirstein Business Library, the first business library donated to, donated to the public by Louis E. Kirstein. And it was the second public business library in the US. It was formerly located for a long, long time at Court Square. It's now in the main branch on uh, Boylston Street. And it's known, known as the Kirstein Business Library and Innovation Center within the main Johnston building. Okay, some superlatives. Well, how about Tallis, the W.E.B. Du Bois Library, as it was renamed uh, a decade or two back at UMass, is the tallest library in the Western Hemisphere. And I think there are a lot of legends around, around this uh, library that apparently aren't true. I used to believe them. There were some scandals involving state contracting back in the 70s and 80s. I think it may have been a library in at Salem State that had a problem because it was designed incorrectly and there may have been some corruption involved, but that was not this library. I think it is sort of an urban legend in Amherst that there's something wrong with this library, but it's not true. Uh, the oldest library building in the United States, the Sturgis Library in Barnstable. Now, I did say oldest building. It wasn't always a library, but part of the library structure includes a house built in 1645 by John Lothrop, who was a minister at the Barnstable Church. So another um, a little peculiar, but uh, charming addition to our list of peculiarities and firsts. Probably, I think I can safely say the most remote library in Massachusetts is this little gem on Cuddyhunk Island. I think in the winter, the population is in the dozens, if that. And it's not exactly easy to get to, but it, these intrepid library lovers will go anywhere, I guess. Okay, largest libraries in the US, Library of Congress, of course, Harvard University, 15 million books uh, as of 06. I don't know, nowadays it gets more confusing because we no longer just count books, we count all kinds of objects and files and what have you. And the Boston Public Library is not far behind that number. And the Yale University Library too, which is not Massachusetts, but not too far away. So it's interesting to see the great concentration of books in this part of the country. And speaking of the Harvard Library, um, you know, it's great these Harvard kids have the biggest, best library in the world. Can you blame them, though, for taking advantage of all the snow during the blizzard of 78 to turn the steps into a ski jump? Okay, some philanthropists that have contributed to our library picture here in Massachusetts. Uh, this is probably the most significant philanthropist, uh, although most of his philanthropy went elsewhere. And it, Enoch Pratt was born in the Middleborough area of Massachusetts. And uh, so he started off in Boston as a, as a merchant selling hardware and then moved to Baltimore and became a huge wholesaler and retailer and very, very wealthy. Um, in Massachusetts, he funded the Pratt Free School in 1856 and then also funded the Middleborough Library in 1856 and again in 1865, though the building here you see on the right is much newer than that. But his main accomplishment was funding the gigantic, famous Enoch Pratt Library in Baltimore, Maryland, between 1882 and 1886, which is still there, one of the nation's largest public libraries. Um, one of the many, many smaller scale um, philanthropists whom I'm familiar with since I, I wrote a book on the centennial of this library is Jacob Edwards of Southbridge, Massachusetts. He also was a local self-made person who uh, was a businessman and merchant. And he not only uh, left money in his will to build this library in 1914 named after him, but he also uh, was an early uh, fan of impressionist paintings and bought many, many famous works, which he subsequently donated to the Museum of Fine Arts. And of course, Andrew Carnegie, who uh, was certainly a titan of business and sometimes a, a kind of, um, I guess, less than angelic figure. But when he became a philanthropist, he went all out. He built 43 or funded 43 public libraries in Massachusetts between 1901 and 1917. Grants told, totaling at the time uh, $1,137,000, uh, which doesn't sound like too much these days, but that would, be, would have been an awful lot of money back then. And he also built five academic libraries at Mount Holyoke College, Radcliffe, Smith, 
Tufts, and Wellesley College. And this is a list of all the towns. Um, I think some of the people who are on the uh, call on the webinar hail from some of these towns. Not too many in the North Shore, but all, all of them are listed here. Revere, Rockland, Dighton, Taunton, South Hadley, Lemonster, Worcester, two, two in Worcester, three in Worcester, um, and so on. Interestingly, four Massachusetts towns were named after library donors. Franklin, my town, named after Benjamin Franklin. Wayland, which had been East Sudbury, was named after the benefactor and Brown president, Reverend Wayland. Um, the, the town of Millis was founded by Lansing Millis. And when they later, his, his son provided money to build their library. So it's a little indirect, but not, nonetheless, the library donor carried that Millis name. And in Hudson, minister, writer, historian, and congressman Charles Hudson was also a benefactor of the local library. And uh, that was part of the reason they named the town for him. That's it. Uh, yeah, this just a little bit more about Reverend Wayland. Um, he's an American ba Baptist minister. He himself was a vocal advocate for libraries. And as I mentioned earlier, his uh, donation kicked off legislation allowing towns to establish libraries. He also established the Wayland Summer Seminary in Virginia to educate former slaves, now known as the Virginia Union, Union University. And there's Millis Lansing with a picture of the, the multi-purpose building that his son um, uh, funded. It's a combination of railroad station, town office, and library, and kind of an architectural gem. An effort is being made now to preserve and restore it. It's been underutilized for decades and sort of in poor repair. As I said, uh, Charles Hudson also uh, established, donated $500 towards establishing a free library for his town. Okay, there are uh, everywhere where you look, almost every town has an architecturally interesting or significant structure, but here are a few that are especially interesting. The Ames Free Public Library, uh, designed by H.H. H. Richardson, who is much celebrated here in the Northeast for his uh, Romanesque revival architecture. Uh, Boston Public, the original, or not the original, but the 19, 1895 building by McKean, Mead, and White, which fortunately is still there. It's um, for those of you who are close to my age or older, you may recall that up till about 1970, this building was black black from decades of coal smoke and every other kind of thing you can imagine. And when they had uh, built the addition next door from the same stone, they finally cleaned it off so that you could see that the stone was the same and that it matched and they've kept it clean subsequently. Of course, that helps that there isn't as much coal smoke anymore in greater Boston. This is the new Philip Johnson wing built between 67 and 72. And of course, right in front of it, unfortunately, is the scene of the marathon bombing. Cambridge Public Library, another, uh, this one was a sort of Richardson knockoff by Van Brunt and Howe from 1888, and the much newer 2009 uh, edition, William Ron Associates. And this, I really personally like this Berkshire Athenaeum out in Pittsfield, uh, William Appleton Potter design from 1876. Okay, some pioneers, leaders, and exemplars. Well, also from Franklin, Horace Mann, uh, and notably, as a young farm boy with no money and very little, few opportunities, limited opportunities for schooling, he would go take himself to see Reverend Nathaniel Emmons and see if he could borrow some of the books from the Franklin donation and a few other books that Reverend Emmons had accumulated, and that was the really the start of his education that eventually propelled him to the law and to Brown University. So all his life, he was a real uh, fan of libraries. And he said, had I the power, I would scatter libraries over the whole land as the sower seeds his wheat field. Okay, uh, the first card catalog in the world was developed between 1840 and 1862. At Harvard, one of the 
uh, creators was assistant librarian Ezra Abbott, who created cards with a hole running through the middle, middle so you could retain them and they wouldn't be taken out. Um, Harvard was also one of the first libraries to employ women. In 1862, they began writing information on catalog cards intended for a public card catalog, which was a first in the United States. And they eventually produced over 35,000 handwritten cards for this catalog. And in 1877, just a year after its founding, the American Library Association voted to standardize catalog card sizes, and they adopted the Harvard Library size. Charles Amy Cut Cutter, also from Harvard, he lived from 1837 to 1903, was another pioneer cataloger. He worked both at the Harvard Libraries and at the huge Boston Athenaeum, which doesn't really get enough mention in my presentation here. Um, the classification he worked on became uh, an influence on later creation of the uh, Library of Congress system. But actually a number of libraries continue to use that uh, system today. There had been no standards up until then and he saw the need at the Harvard Divinity School to have some better way of organizing books. It was great to have index cards and catalogs, but um, how would you help people find them better? When he went to work at the Boston Athenaeum, Athenaeum in 1868, he worked to reorganize their then 170,000 volumes, and he developed his classification system for then, and later developed a version of it for smaller libraries, such as the Cary Memorial Library in Lexington. It's become obsoleted, but um, Forbes Library in Northampton still uses it, as does the Holyoke Public Library in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and a few others in other parts of the world. It has been praised as the most logical system developed in the 19th century for cataloging. And another cataloger, also uh, starting off in the Western Mass area, a mathematically brilliant, uh, very organized gentleman from Amherst College who proposed the decimal system to the college in May of 1873. He would, uh, among other things, he was a fan of simplified spelling so as you can see on the slide here, his uh, given uh, first name was Melville, M-E-L-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, but he liked to spell it M-E-L-V-I-L. -E and likewise, he just would spell his last name D-U-I because he thought it was phonetic enough and worked fine. He wrote a book after his experience at Amherst on cataloging and arranging books and pamphlets, which and became a recognized leader in the field and also uh, helped found the American Library Association he uh, also subsequently started a business to promote all these things, the Library Bureau, which started in Boston and later on moved to New York. But he, he was enormously influential in professionalizing uh, libraries and um, extending the influence of his catalog system. Dewey's, um, oh yeah, helped found the Library Association in 1876 and helped establish the American Library Journal. He also established the first school of library science at Columbia in New York and strongly encouraged the admission of women and the growth of women in the library field. And there's a little library convention invite from that period. Um, not directly related to librarying, but he was a librarian for quite a period of his time. Stanley Kunitz from Worcester. Uh, wrote initially for the Telegram and Gazette, graduated from Harvard, and then went to New York and edited Wilson's Library Bulletin for many years. He also influenced the creation of the Library Bill of Rights after World War II, taught at several colleges and was poet and resident at Brandeis, residing in both Manhattan and Provincetown and received the Pulitzer Prize for poetry and was New York State's Poet Laureate from 1987 to 1989. He died at age 100 in 2006. Another person that um, was not, did not spend his whole career in Boston, but while he was here, Bella Hadvani, uh, working in partnership with Dennis Beaumont, started Computer Library Services, Inc., which in Boston, which was one of the first companies to develop the mini computer for use in the libraries and ended up contributing to the creation of online public access computer market. He was later an early publisher of CD-ROM information and online databases. Jessamine West, librarian extraordinaire. Um, 
best introduced perhaps as the daughter of computer pioneer Tom West, who was uh, her, uh, profiled in Soul of a New Machine, a best-selling book from around 1980 about the data general company and the people who are building the new computers and the excitement of that new technology era. Um, she has gone and supported and maintained the Internet Archives Open Library Project. She's a freelance library consultant, a founder of anti-censorship and pro-free speech um, librarian.net site, and very concerned, of course, about the digital divide that keeps some people from enjoying our information revolution. Okay, presidential libraries. Yep, Massachusetts has them. Boston Public Library has, in effect, presidential library number one. They don't really call it that, but they have a vast collection of President John Adams' papers, in, and that's the beautiful original McKim building with all the John Singer Sargent paintings in the lobby. Um, and they also, the Adams family, of course, also had the Stone Library, which is now part of the Adams National Historic Site in Quincy. And um, it's a beautiful library. I've stuck my head in there at one time on a tour, and I wish I could sneak away from the tour and just explore the place. It looks fabulous. Another public presidential library is in Northampton within the Forbes Library. Calvin Coolidge, who at one time was mayor of Northampton, as you may recall, and then governor of Massachusetts before becoming vice president and then president, decided to donate his papers to uh, Northampton after he left the president's presidency, and they agreed to accept it. So it's uh, certainly far less uh, in scale. It's nothing like more modern presidential libraries. But it's a great collection of ephemera and documents and there's a little museum that you can go through and see photographs from his time in office and little bits and pieces like the famous uh, headdress that he was given by members of an Indian tribe because he um, made some of the arrangements between the federal government and the Native Americans more favorable, one of his small claims to fame. And of course the amazingly beautiful to me, John F. Kennedy Presidential Library on um, on Boston Harbor, which um, I think it's got some free nights coming up if anyone's interested over the summer. And although it's not really quite a full library, Theodore Roosevelt Association collected Theodore Roosevelt's papers and donated them all to Harvard University in 1943. And they're still at the Widener and in, and in the Houghton libraries. So if you want to research something important on Teddy Roosevelt, you go to Harvard and start there. Okay, uh, sort of a library potpourri of some other interesting things that are hard to categorize any other way. The Hull Library is the former home of Irish rebel and, and uh, pilot editor, pilot being the Catholic newspaper from published in Boston for many, many years, John Boyle O'Reilly. Um, he has such an interesting backstory. If I remember it correctly, he had been uh, transported, as they said, as they said, as a convict for his uh, political activities by the British government to Australia. But somehow or other, I'm not sure what the connections were, but a, he arranged for a Massachusetts whaling ship to show up off the coast and row him out to the whaling ship. And, and by that means, he escaped, came to Boston, was very successful, built this lovely house, and then Again, I'm not sure the mechanism, but it became the home of the Hull Library, a really beautiful and unique structure. The Boylston Public Library, um, I mentioned because it, it's changed, they've modernized it and changed a lot of the decorations, but as of about 15 years ago, around the inside of the library, they had dozens and dozens of dozens of unique hand-carved duck decoys, and it was uh, just, it's just a little gem, I mean, and it's also a very attractive little library. But they don't apparently have them anymore, and I don't know why. Private libraries, like the Boston Athenaeum, which I mentioned earlier, um, you can take tours of at least part of the, of the Athenaeum pretty readily, and they have some really nice artwork. It's a fantastic place if you can stick your head in there. I've forgotten the total number of books they have, but it's very big. It's in the hundreds of thousands, maybe a million books in this uh, facility that is, is a membership-only uh, place, but it's been home to lots of writers and political people who've used it for studying and to just 
immerse themselves in ideas. And it's a great gem in the city. Um, as I also, I also mentioned a couple of times, the Widener Library at Harvard, this is an, an unfortunate result of the sinking of the Titanic. This uh, Harvey Elkins Widener was a student at Harvard. And um, during his time at Harvard, he came from a Philadelphia family that was quite wealthy. These are the books he accumulated just while he was at Harvard, 3,200 of them, I believe it is. Um, and that mock-up of his room, or at least of his library, has been preserved and is part of the Widener Library. Um, another unusual library, which is mostly not here any longer, the Grace R. Babson Library of, of Isaac Newton um, at Babson College. Roger Babson was a kind of a, well, genius might be too strong a word, but he, he, he followed the financial markets and was one of the few senior people to anticipate quite correctly the crash of 1929. So he managed to preserve his wealth and maintain his status as a savant. People paid him for his opinions and his research. And um, he and his wife did all kinds of interesting things together, including later in life, he established an, uh, research, so research organization in New Hampshire to study how to um, overcome gravity, <laughs> which, um, yeah, a little, he was a little out there sometimes, but in any case, this lovely room with um, all kinds of original artifacts that belong to Isaac Newton is now on semi-permanent loan to the Huntington Library of California. Um, there are all kinds of amazing libraries at art museums. If you have time when you're visiting an art museum, stop and see the library because you'll often find really wonderful gems that further explain what you're seeing or maybe open you to new um, material and ideas about art and culture. The ones I know about, there may be others, are at the Addison Gallery, Philip Sandover Academy, um, Cape Ann Museum, the Clark Art Institute out in uh, the Berkshires, the Duxbury Art Complex, the Norman Rockwell Museum, which is more of an archive associated with Norman Rockwell himself, the William Morris Hunt Memorial Library at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which is vast and pretty amazing in terms of its holdings. Um, you can find things about art exhibits in the city going back 150 years, as well as reference books and things like that, and Worcester Art Museum. And now that I think of it, I know there's also, um, I think maybe I mentioned that soon, there's a great um, library at the Whaling Museum. Yeah, here is Medford Whaling Museum and the Ernst Meyer Library at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard and their Botany Library at Harvard. And Lars Anderson has an auto museum. I, um, unfortunately, the one time I went, it was under construction. I couldn't get in to see it. But if you have interest in automobiles and such things, you'll find an amazing wealth of information there. Uh, also, Old Sturbridge Village has managed to um, establish a library related to presumably, presumably early Americana. Uh, yeah, libraries, and there are probably more than this, that are also museums. The Emily Williston Memorial Library and Museum in East Hampton and the Winthrop Public Library and Museum. But as we saw with um, the, the Bedford uh, Library and even to some extent the My Town Library in Franklin, there are often art treasures or other things on display within libraries. You have to go explore it or find out where they're hiding, but there are gems to be found. Um, and, you know, maybe a little bit nerdy, but if you have any interest in law or you're studying law or you're just a citizen who wants to better understand uh, something that you're seeing in, in the world around you, all of these trial courts have libraries that are open to the public. Might have to go through security or ask around to find where it is, but once you're in there, you can usually even get uh, borrowing privileges. You just have to provide information about who you are and where you live and so on and so forth, maybe show your ID. But a great specialized library that, that's available to anyone. Really a wonderful thing. Oops, we jumped ahead a little bit. Oh yeah, um, I suspect there's probably similar things at the other medical schools, but I, I'm familiar with the Francis Countway Library on Medicine at Harvard University's Medical School, which is vast and amazing. It's probably one of the, well, it's a, it is one of the leading medical history collections in the world with over 100,000 items. And there's a closely associated 
museum of um, kind of medical oddities um, in the same building, which is worth the worth the price of admission, which I think is free, more than worth it. Um, and you can see you can access the, this for a small fee if you're a member of the public and not associated with Harvard or the medical area. Bookmobiles, kind of an antique idea, but a few towns in the States still have them. Beverly, Chicopee, Natick, New Bedford, and Worcester, which has two of them. Um, and I think my town did have a bookmobile many years ago, 50 or 60 years ago. There's, there's Natick's current bookmobile. Ah, one of the great special collection, the MIT Science Fiction Library, which purports to be the largest such collection of science fiction in one place in the world. Um, and I don't doubt it. Where else but MIT would you find that? Um, I don't know how they feel about public borrowing it, but you could probably go in and look around. And uh, I think, now that I think of it, I think I have a cousin who wrote something that's in there. The Perkins Library at the School for the Blind, again, an amazing specialized library established way back in 1837, now has half a million accessible books, magazines, newspapers, DVDs, and more shared at no cost to 28,000 uh, sight-impaired patrons annually. And this is the Musery, a little more of an oddity and much less substantive but it's located in South Hamilton. It's one of a handful of musical instrument libraries where you can borrow a musical instrument. It was established in honor of John Ryan Pike, a young musician who died at the age of 23. And of course we have these over, actually not overlapping, but interlocking online uh, library systems that allow us to borrow books from within our region or beyond, even nationally and maybe with a little bit of negotiation internationally, um, which is an amazing thing that's a relatively new idea and uh, a huge benefit to the public, especially if your tastes are a little uh, unusual. Okay, that's that's my spiel. I zipped through it a little quickly since we started off late, but I'd be happy to uh, attempt to address any questions folks may have. Um, let me look in the chat room here to see what's going on there. Anybody post anything? Chelmsford has a new oh Chelmsford has a bookmobile. Thank you. And Framingham has a bookmobile. Great. I did not know that. Good information. Um let me go back to the top and read everything that's being said. Westward, we do a great job. Cumberland, okay, yeah. Um, and Robert, if you're still there, feel free to shout out anything I should add to. I'm here, Alan. So I apologize. We are on a backup generator because we lost power. No so kidding. here wow. we are. Uh, but my Wi-Fi connection maintained. Uh, so let's take uh, roughly uh, 10 minutes of questions. We'll wrap around 8.15. Sure. Uh, we have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, so Pat wants to know, is the State Library in the State House? Yes, it is. By the way, folks, there are uh, over 1,600 libraries in Massachusetts, according wow. to the Massachusetts Library System. So I would not expect Alan to be an expert on all 1600. So I just want to keep that in mind. Wow, I'd like to try though. <laughs> cool thing. Uh, Anthony says the rare manuscript room at the Boston Public Library is full of gems. Yes. Uh, what, what have you seen in there, if any? And well, uh, Anthony loves the talk and he learned a lot. Yeah, um, thank you. And uh, I have been in there. I forgot what I was looking for. My wife was, I think, looking for something related to the artist Jugaris, who painted the paintings in our library. I think that's why we were there. Uh, and I believe they had some of his, some holdings of his material. Um, but it is a wonderful, amazing place. Uh, and, Patricia asks, and this is a tough one, Alan. This might uh, be the toughest question you get, okay? And you can't say the Franklin Library. Uh, what is your favorite library? Wow, well, you know, that, is, that is tough. Boston Public's pretty, pretty high up there. That's probably a good bet. Let's put it this way. When I was an impressionable teenager, I was known to st skip school from time to time. And when I did skip school, I was likely to have hitchhiked or gotten a bus into Boston. So I'd go to the Boston Public Library. So it's been a magnet for me my whole life. Um, and really an amazing thing that the public has access to. 
All right. So let's see. Helen, uh, retired life or a, a might be a current, uh, either current or retired librarian, notes that uh, it's the Lois, not Lewis Kirsten uh, Library. She actually started her career there. Thank um, you. So th thanks for the correction, Helen. Uh, John says, what can you tell us about the history of the old Kirsten Business Library, which used to be uh, in uh, Court Square in Boston? Right. Do you know any, anything about, about the background of that library? I don't know library? a lot about it. I think, I think it was founded when this library was founded around 1930. And I used to go in there regularly in the 80s. I think maybe in the state's downturn in the early 90s, it may have gotten closed for budgetary reasons or something. But I do know sometime in the last... 15 years it, it got um, coalesced into the main branch on Boylston Street. I don't know the politics or the exact reasoning. Probably uh, Melissa, uh, oh, sorry, did you have anything more there? Just probably probably a money saving thing, I suppose, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Melissa or Melissa uh, says that she uh, lived in Baltimore for 20 years and is a big fan of the Pratt Library there. Uh, which you referenced. Yes. Uh, uh, Patricia notes that George Peabody established yep. the libraries in Danvers and in Peabody. Wow. So there's another another one to add, another philanthropist yeah. to add to your list. Yeah, and those Peabody's got around. There's so many important institutions with that family name. <laughs> uh, Patricia says Horace Mann was very involved at the Framingham State Teachers College, which yes. is now Framingham State University. Uh, they named a building for him. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I I do know that. But thank you. Uh, Catherine notes that Wayland gave the money to the town of town of Wayland after the library had been established for many years. Uh, John B. Wright from East Sudbury uh, did the legislative bill that created the public library. The Wayland Library is the first legal public uh, library approved by the state to have taxes to support a library. Yep. It's a month older than the Boston, uh, what I think is meant to be the Boston Public Library, and Wayland is uh, celebrating its 175th anniversary. Wow, that's wonderful. Hopefully I got that right, uh, Catherine. Uh, so Catherine notes, you, you had referenced uh, bookmobiles, and I'll tell you, Alan, they're making a comeback. So Framingham, Stephen mentions Framingham has a great bookmobile. Yep. Catherine says Watertown does. Linda says Chumsford does. Uh, I know that uh, here in Tux next next to Tewksbury in uh, Lowell, Lowell is getting a bookmobile. Wow. So they're, they're making a comeback. Yeah. Uh, Francis says, uh, thank you. Uh, interesting information. Uh, John says, does the state have a fund to restore or build town libraries? Well, they do have, I, I think, I'm not an expert, but I believe they have sort of a revolving program that sets aside money for libraries and every, you know, X number, 10 or 20 years, you get a bite at the apple. I know our town, Franklin, uh, applied for money about seven or eight years ago to put on an addition. Um, and it's, uh, there are probably other things for restoration, probably not enough for restoration, frankly, because I know here in Franklin, we've had to look for private funds to do a lot of that. Um, but there are, it's probably a patchwork, but definitely for kind of expansion and, and those kinds of things, there is a, a regular program of that. Yeah, there, there is. And I, I am by no means an expert, but I know that the, um, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners does get um, state funding uh, for, uh, to, to uh, dole out uh, construction grants for new construction or renovation, renovation expansion. Uh, for public libraries, uh, and you know, it's never enough money. But um, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and there's this complicated formula, I think, based on you know population and square footage and all this and that. But you know, usually libraries can get reimbursed. Uh, the uh, the municipality can get reimbursed. You know, a certain percentage of the construction costs uh, yeah. through this through this construction grant program. So. Uh, more information about that is on the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, and there's probably other people on this call that are more uh, knowledgeable yeah. uh, on that as, than I am. Um, Judy says, thank you. Dory says, the Malden Public Library has a great art collection, mm. and she considers it a, a museum uh, in addition to a library. Nice. Uh, Catherine notes that Interlibrary Loan has been around for more than 40 years. Yeah, 40, four zero years yep. and I and she notes that she's used it internationally 
for many, many years. Nice. All right, we're starting to wind down. Joyce says she loved the presentation. Stephen says, thank you very much, Earl. Excellent presentation. I'm a li I didn't know this, Stephen. I'm a librarian, also from Franklin, uh, oh. and really appreciate our Franklin Library. I also <laughs> enjoy the books you've written, including the ones on 128 High Tech Belt and Raytheon. Nice, thank you. Uh, Mariette asks, can you talk a bit about the interior decor of many of the old libraries, things like fireplaces, grandfather clocks, and built-in bookcases? Well, um, yes, all those things are there. I, I, I guess I just expect to see something like that when I go to a Massachusetts or New England library that's older. I, I, I can't really catalog them or remember which ones are which, but I, you know, the Forbes Library, the Franklin Library. Uh, Franklin Library, I'll have to note, they were on a budget, so the, the fireplaces are actually faux fireplaces, but uh, they still look good. Um, and uh, yeah, I think those are very common. And, and I guess I would say that you don't see those in modern libraries. I guess maybe they'd seem out of place, but they seem to make the place so much more welcoming. It just seems to invite you to slow down and pick up a book and think and experience something and not just rush through. So um, those are sort of old fashioned, but they sure make the libraries wonderful in my humble opinion. So Mary, uh, last week, I'm not sure if you were on the call or not, but last Wednesday night, uh, we hosted a gentleman uh, named Greg. He is himself as a librarian here in Massachusetts, but he started an initiative called the Library Land Project. So Google Library Land Project. And what he's doing is he's trying to visit every public library in Massachusetts. And ultimately, he'd love to visit every Massachusetts public library in the country. Uh, but he's already visited more than 400 public libraries. Wow. And when he's there, he takes notes and he takes a lot of photographs. Mm -hmm. And some of the photographs are, are up on his social media and on his website. Uh, so if you Google Library Land Project, uh, you will see uh, some of these um, fireplaces, grandfather clocks, and built-in bookcases that you speak of. Uh, so Sally says this was an outstanding program, very interesting, so many firsts in Massachusetts libraries. Thank you so much. Wow, well, thank uh, you. Robert says the 1797 building currently occupied by the Greenfield Public Library goes vacant, vacant in a couple of days. The wow. city is seeking buyers. A new library in Greenfield is opening up next door in July. Wow. Well, that's both exciting and kind of sad, Ron, yeah. but that's 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 interesting. I'm a big field fan of the Greenfield uh, librarians, I will say that. Uh, huh. Frank says, bravo, great presentation on a great resource. As a student, I worked part-time at the Yale Library. Whenever we travel, we visit the local libraries. Libraries are magical places. Amen. All right, let's do five more minutes. We do have uh, some, I'm going to jump back to the Q&A, uh, Alan. Uh, so, uh, well, first, a comment from Diana, not a question, but I think I heard you say there was no problem with the UMass library. Uh, bricks were falling off the building and they had to rope it off. Okay. okay. And, uh, Alan, have you been to the UMass? I'm not I, sure. I exactly. have, not in a few years. And, and I guess I'm, they have very defensive propaganda on their website that or, or somewhere that, that said, you know, with no problem here, nothing to see. So I guess maybe I, I missed that, but that's good to know. Okay. Uh, can't always judge a library by its website. I've learned that. Right. <laughs> uh, Kathleen says, can you talk about the ways libraries have expanded their mission uh, from, from book groups to presentations on all kinds of subjects? Right. And that's certainly an ongoing thing. And again, I'm not by any means an expert, but, you know, clearly we, we had the vision that libraries were going to be change agents from the start. You know, they were educate they were to educate literate literate people to be more learned, and uh, they were the, the 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 classroom for people who couldn't afford to go to a classroom or couldn't afford to go to college. Um, the especially with the internet and everyone, you know, giving up paper and giving up books. I think there's a great rush on to to find new missions. And I personally worry that we may miss some of the old mission. I, I, I don't travel a lot, but I did get to go to Ireland a few years ago, and it seems like every little town has a bookstore and a library. Mm -hmm. Bookstore is what struck me the most because here bookstores are very hard to find, except maybe big big shopping centers or big cities. So I think there's the potential for people to be brought back to 
books and literature and some of the traditional things, but it's wonderful and important that libraries are, are embracing so many other things, especially, you know, ESL programs and things like that to support people where they are and the needs they have. It's, mm -hmm. I guess it's, it, it, it's kind of an all-purpose semi-governmental thing that can fill in the gaps that a lot of other things don't cover, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, Elaine says the Lawrence Library in Pepperell has 110 local birds carefully mounted and labeled in their uh, lyceum. Wow. So there's something. Did not know that about Pepperell. Uh, Kathleen says, I drove by the Sandwich Library today, and it was great to see librarians on the lawn enrolling children and adults in summer <laughs> reading programs. Uh, Ginny wants to give a shout out to another gem. The Boston Symphony Orchestra has a library of sheet music wow. um, at Symphony Hall. There you go. Cool. I did not know that. And I'm uh, sure Dory there... wants. Oh, oh, sorry, Alan. I'm sure there are probably a lot of other specialty libraries I've missed out on. You know, there used to be a, a geophysical library, I think, at, at uh, Hanscom Air Force Base. I think it's moved, but it was mm -hmm. for geologists and scientists or something. It's Harvard Smithsonian. Uh, astrophysical has a huge library of things about the universe. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, I think that's a great question, too. There are a lot of uh, private libraries uh, and special libraries. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know who has the master list of libraries. I don't know if it's the mass library system or this or the uh, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners or the state library. But I'd love to see a comprehensive list of all mm. 1600 libraries in the state. Um, Dory wants to know if you have any familiarity with the Wakefield Library. It's the, the BB Library in Wakefield. Uh, she thinks it's beautiful. Um, and is it Linfield as well? Because I know, isn't there a BB Library in Wakefield? I didn't know about Linfield. That's what she said, Wakefield. Oh, Wakefield. Okay, if I misspoke. Yes, I am, I am familiar with it. I've stuck my head in there and it's, it's wonderful. Uh, Alan wants to know if you have any familiar, familiarity with the Nahant Library. And he notes their no. second floor is made of glass. Wow. wow. Yeah. Did not know that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Barb says, my elementary school friends and I got jobs as pages to sort and file books at the Boston Public Library. I started as a page myself, Barb. Uh, we all learned so much, not only about books, but people who love them, and we all became lifelong learners. Lovely. Very nice. Um, I think Joyce's question was asked, was sort of answered in a previous question. Helen has some more information about the Kirsten Library. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it was founded in the 1930s by the Kirstens. One of them founded Filene's and the other, right. the New York City Ballet, uh -huh. never closed. A patron, Mr. Dre, who I knew, donated six million dollars, and then they moved it to the central, or, or so that they could move it to the central library. I see. Good to know. All right. I think. Um, all right. So I think. Let me just jump back to the chat. But I think we're pretty much done. Uh, some nice comments here. Uh, Melissa says, "I loved my time at night at Pratt, and uh, also at Copley." Quiet. Uh, online services. Ross says, do you have any insight to the problems historical library pre buildings present for disability access? So that's interesting. Yeah, uh, she notes a that, um, uh, Green, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess Greenfield uh, had an issue with uh, the, the, um, the, there were a lack of ramps uh, and yeah. appropriate entrances. So. Yeah, All right. I think we did it, Alan. So, wow. Alan, uh, so folks, let's give Alan a big virtual round of applause. Um, okay. I, I, again, apologize for the technical difficulties. Sorry for starting about 20 minutes late, but we've gone the hour. Um, Alan, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? No, I'm just thrilled to see other library fans come out. I'm a, I'm a library fan, so it's all good. Thank you for your patience, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity, Robert. Yeah, no problem, Alan. So folks, I'll look for it for those watching live. I'll look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording. Uh, please share it with all the library lovers in your life. Uh, also a link to a feedback survey, uh, information on some other upcoming virtual programs. 
And I will also um, list all the uh, partnering libraries who helped promote tonight's talk. So uh, Alan, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for watching. Enjoy this rainy, stormy weather. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yep, bye -bye. Thank you.